I'm Roy Lee Lindsay with the North Carolina Pork Council, and I want everyone to remember, bacon makes everything better. Welcome, everyone, to This Week in College Football with David Glenn, brought to you by our great friends at the North Carolina Fort Council. I'm Chris Edwards. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. On our show here in 2024, DG and I will mostly look ahead at the upcoming week's college football matchups. We'll also discuss college football's biggest headlines and take a quick glance back with some of DG's expert analysis on the biggest games and developments from the previous week's schedule. DG now in his 38th season covering college football, both here in North Carolina and around the Atlantic Coast Conference. But, DG, as we mentioned last week, it was one of the few weekends you were not out watching a college football game in person, not watching a game on TV, not even doing a tailgate tour. So I got to know, how was the party? How were the nuptials? Well, the great news is, and the most important news is, Chris, is it's always good to be with you, that my son, Anthony, And my now daughter-in-law, Sydney, had an absolutely beautiful, wonderful wedding right here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where they both went to Millbrook High School. They both also happen to be proud graduates of East Carolina University. Uh, Almost everything went swimmingly. The bride was beautiful. My son had the time of his life. Uh, My wife and I, the lovely and talented Maria, and I had a, a blast as well. I did have a weird side trip, Chris to the emergency room of a local hospital for what turned out to be food poisoning. Uh, But I am not going to spoil the story with those details. Those were ugly, ugly details. All the audience needs to know is that Sydney and Anthony are now happily married and residing here in the great state of North Carolina. Don't eat the fish, apparently, for DG uh, (laughs) is what I'm hearing. All right, let's dive in to the football action. We're going to get to some of the biggest developments from last week, which included the much-needed wins for App State. NC State and UNC. But let's first look ahead to this week's action here in week 11. Some intriguing storylines, DG involving some NC State teams. So we get to those right away. And this segment brought to you by our good friends at Atlantic Tire and Service, where DG and his family take all of their vehicles for routine maintenance, service needs, and a world class selection of new tires. Atlantic Tire and Service, your one stop tire and auto repair provider with highly trained technicians and a sales and support staff second to none. They've grown to six Triangle Area locations, two in Raleigh, two in Cary, one in Durham, and one in Wake Forest. You can learn more at AtlanticTireOnline.com. All right, DG, let's start with a big one in Raleigh this week, 3.30 on Saturday, 6-3 and three Duke off the loss at Miami, visits 5-4 and four NC State. Wolfpack, of course, beating Stanford last week. Wolfpack a three-point favorite at Carter-Finley. Yeah, quick note first, uh, our old North State tailgate is going to be there near Carter-Finley Stadium. So I encourage folks to follow our social media accounts because we're headed to ECU on Thursday. We'll tell you some of those details later. Uh, And we're heading to uh, NC State on Saturday. So we have a little bit of a tailgate toward doubleheader this week. But this Duke-NC State rivalry is actually a classic example of the casualties of conference expansion, right? These schools are located only about 22 or so miles apart. They've been members of the same leagues, including the Atlantic Coast Conference, for an eternity. And from 1924 to 2003, so that's a period of 80 consecutive years, 8-0, the only interruption to their annual matchup came in 1944 when they missed a single game because of World War II. (laughs) However... Because of, of course, the continued rounds of ACC expansion, this did stop being an annual rivalry about two decades ago. So, for example, even though this is Coach Dave Doran's 12th season as the NC State head football coach, this is only the fourth time in those 12 years that his Wolfpack will face the nearby Blue Devils. Back when the ACC had divisions, remember? The Wolfpack was in the Atlantic. The Devils were in the Coastal. So they just have not faced each other as often lately. The bottom line in the particulars of this year's matchup is that both Duke and State could end up with a mediocre record, like a 6-6, and but 
either one could win out if you look at the schedule and could end up with a much prettier record and a much better bowl invitation. So essentially, each team is standing directly in the way of the other with these sorts of things in mind. One's going to take an important step forward on Saturday at Carter Finley. The other's going to take a step back inevitably toward a mediocre campaign. Who will it be? Well, to me, the Wolfpack has been mediocre on both sides of the ball all season, but the Pack just played its most complete game of the entire year, 59-28, a victory over Stanford. And true freshman quarterback C.J. Bailey had his third consecutive really strong outing. 18 for 20 passing, 234 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions against the Cardinal. Meanwhile, this Duke team that has been mostly mediocre offensively, but truly elite defensively this season under the first year head coach Manny Diaz, those Blue Devils just had by far their worst defensive game of the season, albeit a 53-31 loss at the hands of the now 9-0 and nationally number four ranked Miami Hurricanes. There are a couple of quick fun wrinkles in this one. Duke coach Manny Diaz was an NC State assistant coach under Chuck Amato for six seasons, not crazy long ago. And NC State's starting running back, Jordan Waters, was actually an all-ACC performer for the Blue Devils just last season. Uh, in the end, the number one key to this game, to me by far, is how often Diaz's very well-coached defense at Duke can confuse or pressure or maybe create turnovers with that Wolfpack young, true freshman quarterback, C.J. Bailey, who has been excellent lately, but also is making just the sixth college start of his young career in this one. All right, how about down the road from Carter Finley in Winston-Salem? It's 4-4 four and four Cow trekking east to the Old North State to take on the 4-4 four and four Wake Forest Demon Deacons. 8 o'clock Saturday night out in Winston-Salem. Cow, so maybe surprisingly to some, a seven-point road favorite in Winston-Salem. Yeah, I'll get right to the bottom line in this one. 11th-year Wake Forest coach Dave Clawson is one of the best coaches in the program's entire history. And from 2016 through 2022, remember, he took the Demon Deacons to a school record seven consecutive bowl games. But if he's going to get back to the postseason this year, he needs to win this game against the Cal Bears. The Deeks are 4-4. Four and four. You need six wins for automatic bowl eligibility. And this final stretch for Wake consists of Cal this week, a trip to an improving UNC squad in Chapel Hill, another trip to undefeated Miami, and then a home game against what we just described as a very competitive Duke team. Las Vegas probably will have Wake as the underdog in all four of those games. As you mentioned, they do against Cal. The analytics mostly agree with that assessment, but this Cal game is, to me, the most winnable of the four, so the Deeks better get it. Wake's number one problem all season has been that there is just not the usual level of special talent on the defensive side of the ball. The Deeks are giving up 31 points per game. That's second worst in the ACC, only to Stanford. But Cal does not have an elite offense this year. They don't run the ball very well, the Bears, most weeks. Their quarterback, Fernando Mendoza, is a really smart guy and a game manager, but not as much of a big numbers guy who can repeatedly beat you down the field with his arm. The most interesting part of this game, to me, comes when Wake has the ball because the Deeks have plenty of talent on offense, and Cal is right now, by far, the number one scoring defense in the entire ACC at only 17 points per game. That's really impressive number at this stage of the season especially. So it's going to be strength versus strength when the Deeks send out their sixth-year senior quarterback, Hank Bachmeyer, who we've also often described this year as the best quarterback in our state this year, plus DeMond Claiborne, one of the best running backs in the ACC all year. Wideouts like Taylor Morin, one of the better receivers and return men in the ACC this year. Without a win in this one, I don't think I don't like the Deacons' chances, I'll put it that way, of making the postseason. They, they missed it last year, and I think they're going to miss it this year again unless they beat Cal and get back to that tradition that they started with that seven-year bowl streak that made history not too long ago. What about this nationally televised game in Greenville on Thursday night? It's two and six, Florida Atlantic visiting four and four East Carolina. Eight o'clock Thursday night, Pirates are a seven point favorite at Dowdy Ficklet and DG, our old North State tailgate. 
will be in Greenville on Thursday night as well. Yeah, that'll be part one of the Old North State tailgate. So uh, if I'm up for it physically after the uh, hospitalization, well, I'll be there. But my crew definitely will be there, even if I am not. Uh, as ECU's athletic director, John Gilbert, continues his search, of course, for a new football coach in the aftermath of Mike Houston's dismissal midway through what was his sixth season leading the Pirates. This university gets this national TV window on a Thursday night against a very beatable opponent in FAU. And the team really is continuing its pursuit of a bowl game under the interim coach, Blake Harrell. For the record, I am officially listed as doubtful for the tailgate tour stop. But again, 5.30 to 7.30, uh, we'll be with our Pirate Radio friends in Greenville at their usual location next to Dowdy Ficklin Stadium in those two hours or so leading up to the 8 o'clock kickoff on Thursday night against Florida Atlantic. Regarding the matchup itself, ECU is in a situation very similar to the one I just described with Wake Forest. Pirates are 4-4, four and four, as you said. Their remaining games are against this mediocre FAU team, then mediocre Tulsa next Thursday, so they get back-to-back -back Thursday night games. But then they have to end with a much tougher North Texas squad on the road and then a very tough Navy squad that's been in the headlines all season. Bottom line, if you're going to get to six or more wins – you'd better beat FAU on your home field this week before heading on the road for those next two games. The most optimistic news for the Pirates is that after having the absolute worst quarterback play in the entire country last season, and then all sorts of turnover problems under their starting QB, Jake Garcia, the Miami and Missouri transfer earlier this season, they finally took a step forward offensively last week with Michigan State transfer, Caton Hauser, at the controls during what was a 56-34 victory over Temple. Hauser was far from perfect against the Owls. He completed only 55% of his passes, got picked off twice. But he did compile 269 passing yards, and he connected on five touchdown passes to five different receivers. We have not seen a lot of that in Greenville lately. If an improved passing game can complement What's sometimes, but not always, a pretty solid, decent rushing attack led by the veteran Rajay Harris, then the Pirates should have more than enough to beat FAU on Thursday night. DG, as we wrap up this opening segment, maybe give me at least one game involving one in-state team that's worth more of a brief mention in our conversation this week. Yeah, just the one this time, Chris. Four and four App State goes to four and four Coastal Carolina. This is yet another Thursday night game, eight o'clock ESPN. With their backs to the wall these last two weeks, let's give the Mountaineers credit. And with head coach Sean Clark's future hanging in the balance, essentially, the Mountaineers posted back-to-back -back home wins over Georgia State and Old Dominion to level that record at 4-4. Four and four. This trip to Coastal in another prominent national TV window on a Thursday night. Remember, that didn't go well for the Mountaineers and Boone earlier this season. It is yet another must-win for App State because the Mountaineers' final two games look to be very difficult ones. Home against James Madison and then at longtime rival Georgia Southern, which right now looks to be in position to end up in the Sun Belt Championship game. A road win over, over Coastal on Thursday would give the Mountaineers a three-game winning streak, of course, but it also could give them the kind of confidence boost or momentum they likely are going to need if they're going to make more hay during that more difficult part of their remaining regular, ski, uh, regular season schedule a bit later. All right, stay with us. We'll have more of This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by our friends at the North Carolina Port Council, coming up in just a moment right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. In sports, we talk a lot about impact players who make a positive difference. When it comes to our state's economy, the North Carolina pork industry is a true MVP. Each year, the pork industry plays an important role in supporting rural communities across our state. It contributes more than $10 billion a year to the North Carolina economy and supports more than 44,000 jobs. Learn more about their positive impact at ncpork.org. The North Carolina Pork Council, the foundational partner of the North Carolina Sports Network. Michael Berard, Managing Director Investments with the Founders Group at Stiefel, works with a select group of high net worth individuals and institutions to develop and implement investment plans tailored to their specific objectives and risk tolerances. 
If you are interested in highly personalized, well-researched guidance and outstanding personal service, you can contact Michael at 984-364-2002. That's 984-364-2002. Stiefel Nicholas and Company Incorporated, member SIPC and NYSE. Welcome back to This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by our friends at the North Carolina Port Council. DG diving right into our ACC and National Week 11 look ahead, brought to you by our good friends at XL Moving and Storage, a family-owned Allied Van Lines partner here in North Carolina with 25 years of award-winning experience that can help you with your move to North Carolina, within North Carolina, or away from North Carolina, even internationally, while also assisting with your storage needs. You can learn more at excelms.com. That's XL Moving and Storage. Only two ranked-on-ranked matchups this week in the entire national schedule, DG. They're both all Southeastern Conference affairs, but we'll start with an ACC clash because Clemson in danger of falling entirely out of the ACC championship race for a second year in a row and the third time in the last four seasons. The Tigers ranked number 19 in the poll this week. They're 6-2 and two off that loss at home to Louisville last Saturday night. And they're on the road this week at 5-4 and four Virginia Tech. 3.30 kickoff from Lane Stadium. Tigers are a six-point road favorite in a game that will air on ESPN. Yeah, we're including this game because if Clemson falters even once more down the stretch during this regular season, and this Virginia Tech team with Enter Sandman screaming in the background there in Blacksburg is no pushover despite what that 5-4 and four record next to the Hokies' name may suggest. If the Tigers stumble either here or elsewhere, remember they have a solid-looking South Carolina team from the SEC later this year, there is going to be a massive increase in the howls toward Clemson coach Dabo Sweeney and his way of doing things in this new college sports environment, especially with Dabo's skepticism toward the transfer portal and his insistence on relying on you know, the old school way of signing and developing your own high school signees rather than building more with transfers, with which a lot of the most successful teams have been doing lately. Keep in mind that when the world changed, both transfer portal, but also immediate eligibility, name, image, likeness, right before the world changed, what had Dabo d- done at Clemson? How about six straight ACC titles and six straight finishes in the national top four? That was before the world changed. You can't do much better than that. Remember, in that six-year stretch, of course, were the 2016 and 2018 national championships. Doesn't get much better than that. I mean, along with like a Bobby Bowden era at Florida State back in the day, that stretch under Dabo, not very long ago at all, 2015 through 2020, Mm -hmm. that is about as great a dynasty as any in the history of a 70-plus-year-old league. Then the world changed, right? Well, if Dabo struggles down the stretch here, that'll be three of the last four years that the Tigers are not the ACC champion. Uh, There have been no top 10 finishes in that stretch after six straight top four finishes. Those are very different results right after the world changed. Could Clemson run the table, be 10 and two, get some help elsewhere and end up in the ACC title game? And of course, if you're there, you could win that game and punch your ticket to the college football playoff. All that's still possible. But the Hokies won't be easy. The Gamecocks won't be easy later. And that's why this is worth watching this weekend because the Tigers, even as a favorite at Lane Stadium, they they showed last week they're just not quite as dominant in their loss to the Louisville Cardinals. That was at Death Valley. Louisville was flat out the better team than Clemson. Those are more alarm bells that we didn't hear surrounding the Tigers for about six years. So that's why this one's really going to be under the microscope. All right, to the SEC now, where number two Georgia puts their seven and one record on the line at number 16 Ole Miss. The Rebs are seven and two. This is the 3:30 Saturday game on ABC. The Bulldogs of Georgia, a two-point favorite in Oxford. Yeah, this game's a bigger deal for the Dogs, at least in one sense, than it is for the Rebels. Georgia still has a great shot at playing in the SEC title game, whereas Ole Miss, which already has two losses in conference play probably does not have a realistic road to that championship game. Under Georgia's ninth-year head coach, Kirby Smart, the Bulldogs have won 
two national championships, two SEC titles. They finished in the national top 10 for a stunning seven years in a row. If you lose at Ole Miss on Saturday afternoon, Georgia would actually be at risk of having its worst season. And I'm putting worst in air quotes because we'd all love to have bad seasons like this. But it would be Kirby Smart's worst season since his first year in Athens, which at this point is quite a while ago. What makes this matchup scary in the particulars for Georgia is that Ole Miss leads the SEC in scoring offense at 42 points per game and in passing offense at about 377 yards per game. We actually talked about on our show, Chris, the Rebels' incredibly accurate quarterback, Mm -hmm. Jackson Dart, before he and the Rebels went to Wake Forest and absolutely thrashed the Demon Deacons defense right there in Winston-Salem earlier this year. Dart is still completing about 72% of his passing attempts this season, and he has 21 touchdown passes against only three interceptions. He and the Ole Miss head coach Lane Kiffin have been an amazing combination, especially over these last two seasons when the Rebels' combined record is 18-4. and Georgia is that slight favorite here, as you said but especially with this one being played in Oxford against that dangerous quarterback, I think anything can happen. Dart, a best name for a quarterback by (laughs) far, isn't it? Uh, Game three on the docket this week. Maybe an elimination game, DG, as it relates to the college football playoff. Alabama, number 11 in the country. They're 6-2 and at number 14, LSU, also 6-2. and Saturday night, 7-30 on ABC. The Crimson Tide, three-point road favorites in Baton Rouge. Yeah, this one's intriguing to me in part because the first-year Alabama head coach, Kalen DeBoer, who has that impossible task of succeeding perhaps the greatest of all time, Nick Saban, he's already lost twice in his first eight games with the Crimson Tide, including once to the traditional SEC seller dweller, I know they're good this year, the Vanderbilt Commodores. For perspective, keep in mind that in Nick Saban's 17 seasons at Alabama, The Crimson Tide lost more than two games in a single season only twice. Mm. The first time was his first year there, which was understandable way back in 2007. A little rebuilding was required. The second time was his fourth season there, Saban in 2010, when Alabama finished 10-3 and and still finished the season ranked in the national top 10, which is just an an insane accomplishment during a quote-unquote down year. That is an almost impossible standard to sustain for any head coach. But DeBoer still has a shot, as we speak, at a 10-2 and regular season here in this debut season at Bama, with this trip to LSU perhaps being the hardest challenge of the Tide's four remaining regular season games. On the other side, meanwhile, LSU's head coach Brian Kelly actually right now has a much better shot than Alabama of playing in the SEC title game because the Tigers have only one loss in conference play, whereas both of Bama's losses were to conference opponents. LSU's finishing stretch is Alabama this week, then at a struggling Florida Gators team, home against Vandy, home against Oklahoma. That's a lot more manageable than mighty Bama coming to town, that other stretch. If the Tigers finish 7-1 and in conference play, which would be very doable if they can take care of the Tide in Baton Rouge on Saturday night, they would have a great chance of playing for the SEC title. And that would give Brian Kelly two trips to the SEC championship game in these first three seasons with the Tigers, which is what they expected when they backed up the Brinks truck to hire him away from Notre Dame a few years ago. LSU's biggest problem in this matchup is that the Tigers do not run the ball very well. And Alabama's defense has a lot of dudes in the front seven, and they've been getting better during the course of this season. If you're a neutral fan, my suggestion is just to enjoy the quarterback matchup. You have Garrett Nussmeyer, a really good thrower on one side. Jalen Milrow, a dual threat guy on the other side. They are two of the SEC's best this season. So no matter who wins, it should be entertaining on Saturday night. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back and have more of This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council, coming up in a minute on the North Carolina Sports Network. This segment brought to you by our great friends at Atlantic Tire and Service, where DG and his family take all of their vehicles for routine maintenance, service needs, and a world-class selection of new tires. Atlantic Tire and Service, your one-stop tire and auto repair provider, 
with highly trained technicians and a sales and support staff that are second to none. They've grown to six Triangle Area locations, two in Raleigh, two in Cary, one in Durham, and one in Wake Forest. You can learn more online at AtlanticTireOnline.com. The original Salt Works has become a legendary breakfast, brunch, and lunch place in Wilmington for both locals and out-of-town visitors over the last 50-plus years. Our good friend Bob Hubbard owns the place, but he's also the one cooking your food and often roaming the dining room to greet you with a smile and to make sure your visit is a great one. Bob has been running the show at this unique roadside diner for more than 20 years now, and he and his friendly, hardworking staff aim to treat you like one of their own. Try Bob's homemade omelets, or special recipe grits for breakfast, or his legendary cheeseburgers for lunch. The Original Salt Works, your breakfast and lunch choice on Oleander Drive in Wilmington. Welcome back to This Week in College Football with Dave Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council. DG, diving right into our coaches and quarterback segment, brought to you by our good friends at Lawson Insurance, who just last week celebrated their family-owned business's 50th anniversary. These guys help DG and many other North Carolina citizens and businesses with their personal and commercial insurance needs. You can reach out to the brothers Ken Miller and Michael Lawson. Like all of us, they're huge sports fans. Give them a call, 919-846-2090, or search Lawson Insurance online. DG, we're switching back to focus on coaches this week with some of the teams that we followed at the end, or almost at the end, of their regular season. There are 33 NCAA football programs here in our state, so much more high profile than others, but we, of course, follow all of them here at the North Carolina Sports Network. Who are your two or three leading contenders as we talk right now from any level of college football in our state, if we were to hand out a statewide Coach of the Year honor at the end of the season? Yeah, Chris, there's still a little bit of time for someone else to jump into this picture. By the way, with uh, Lawson Insurance in mind, please remind me to tell the three brothers that I was hospitalized, and that's why I missed their anniversary event. That sound, that's, it sounds like a good excuse, at that's least, right? Excuse. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> there, there is time for another coaching candidate to jump into this conversation. But speaking of the three Lawson brothers, three coaches come to mind right away, even though two of them just lost last week. The first year Duke coach, Manny Diaz, is still a candidate for now for our statewide coach of the year honor, even after the Devils lost at undefeated Miami on Saturday. The third year Johnson C. Smith coach, Maurice Flowers, also still a candidate even after losing at home to Fayetteville State on Saturday and then dropping out of the Division II top 25 rankings. And now, by the way, the first-year Wingate coach, I've been told you're allowed to say Wingate or Wingate. Do you have an opinion as a professional yourself, Chris? Because I, 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 I was at the university, and their own fans gave me two different answers. I've heard both. My brother went to school there, and he says both. All right. I'm going to – I feel like I have your blessing then. Uh, Rashawn Jordan, the first year head coach at Wingate slash Wingate. He's also become a very serious candidate. I'm going to talk a little bit more about him and his Bulldogs a little bit later in our final segment. But here's where November and December matters, matter so much for these purposes. Manny Diaz is 6-3 and three at Duke right now as the Devils head to, to Raleigh, right? If his Blue Devils somehow beat NC State at Carter-Finley this week, and then they beat Virginia Tech and Wake Forest after an open week. And that's not inconceivable, right? Well, then they'd be 9-3 and three to conclude the regular season with a shot at the 10-win mark in a bowl game. That would be an insanely impressive first year or any year for any coach at Duke, especially given that Duke is a program that has produced exactly one 10-win season in the history of its program. And remember the Blue Devils, as we discussed way back in August, lost a ton of talent in the transfer portal after Coach Mike Elko left to take the Texas A&M job, obviously making Manny Diaz's task that much more complicated. Obviously, if the opposite happens down the stretch and the bottom falls out and Duke finishes 6-6, six and six, well, then you can still give Coach Diaz credit for a decent debut, but he certainly would not be a serious candidate for our coaching award or, I imagine, any other at that point. Similarly, with Coach Maurice Flowers at Johnson C. Smith, there is still a chance that the Golden Bulls could finish the regular season 9-1 and 
which would represent one of the best records in the history of a program that dates back to the late 1800s. And there's still a chance that the Bulls could tie for the CIAA football title, which they've won only one time in almost 100 years as a member of that league. If either or both of those things happen, obviously Coach Flowers becomes very hard to beat for our North Carolina Coach of the Year honor. The bottom line, our goal is to celebrate excellence. And we know excellence rarely comes in the form of a perfect football season. Maybe that excellence will come in the form of a 10-win campaign at Duke or elsewhere. Maybe in the form of a conference championship at J.C. Smith or elsewhere. Maybe in the form of a long playoff or postseason run, given some of the big brackets at the lower divisions of football. Or maybe in the form of just doing something at a particular school that's never been done there, rarely been done there, or maybe hasn't been done in a long time at that specific school. Out of those 33 head coaches here in North Carolina, we definitely will be able to find someone worth celebrating, I promise you, at the end of this 2024 season. All right, let's stick with the coaches and let's hone in on the ACC. You voted in the ACC Coach of the Year honor now many times, I guess going back decades at this point, DG. Uh, who are the leading candidates right now for the 2024 edition of that award? And if you had to vote today, whose name would you put on the ballot? Yeah, if I had to vote today, I'll answer that second question first. My vote would go to Mario Cristobal, the head coach of the 9-0 Miami Hurricanes. Um, but at this stage, I would not yet count out a few others. Mm -hmm. uh, Rhett Lashley has SMU 8-1, and one, ranked number 13 in the nation, unbeaten in conference play, and a serious candidate to play in the ACC championship game during, remember, what is the Mustangs' first ever season in this new league, after they won the American Athletic Co Conference Football Championship just last year in their final season in that league. I also would not count out Pat Narduzzi. He has Pitt 7-1, and one, ranked 23rd nationally, and he could get the Panthers to 10 or more wins this season. Finally, and this one's a little bit more of a long shot, I wouldn't count out Coach Manny Diaz, again, if he finishes strongly at Duke. I wouldn't count out another first-year guy in the Syracuse leader, Fran Brown. He has the orange at six and two with at least the possibility of getting that program to the 10 win mark. At that school, it would be just the third time in the last 30 plus years they got to 10 wins. Again, long way to go. Those pictures will clear themselves up by the end of November. But back to Cristobal quickly. Uh, the front runner for the ACC Coach of the Year, in my eyes, is the guy who leads the number four team in the national rankings. I know others always look for the surprise team or the surprise coach. I start with who's having the best year and how did they put that best year together. The backdrop matters in my eyes. The Hurricanes are 9-0. They are ranked number four in both polls. Miami's program is, in the bigger picture, a five-time national championship program. but. The Hurricanes have not won any national title since 2001. The Canes have not finished even in the national top 10 since 2003, which not mere coincidentally was right before they joined the Atlantic Coast Conference. So national titles, top 10 finishes all the time, and then they join the ACC, and then not at all. That's a pretty big threshold roughly 20 or so years ago. Since joining the ACC prior to that 20, 2004 season, that's exactly 20 years ago now, the Canes have never won the ACC championship. They've never finished in the national top 10. And only once did they even make the 10-win the, the mark or the ACC title game. That was uh, in 2017 under Mark Richt when they were 10-3 and three and made that only trip to the ACC championship game. Now, in just his third season in Carl Gables, Mario Cristobal has the Canes poised for the kind of campaign over these last 20 years that Larry Coker couldn't deliver, and neither could Randy Shannon, Al Golden, Mark Richt, Manny Diaz. Um, since 2004, none of those special things have happened. If Mario Cristobal can finish that job at that school under those circumstances, he will be, to me, the 2024 ACC Football Coach of the Year. All right, let's burn our last time out. We'll come back and wrap things up with DG on This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by the North Carolina Port Council, right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. The Lawson Insurance Group in Raleigh is a family-owned business led by three actual brothers, 
who happen to be huge sports fans, Ken Lawson, Miller Lawson, and Michael Lawson. I know these guys, I trust these guys, and I send these guys my own insurance business and that of my family. The next time you have insurance needs, I hope you'll do the same. The Lawson Insurance Group is known for its commitment to community and its dedication to ensuring that North Carolinians and their businesses are prepared for life's inevitable challenges with the reminder that as a high street insurance partner, Lawson Insurance Group offers local expertise and support that combined with High Street's extensive national resources means more choice and support for you as their client. To learn more, search Lawson Insurance Group online. The Lawson Insurance website will be the first link that pops up. Whether you are moving locally, nationally, or even internationally, and whether you're a residential or a commercial customer, please consider our friends at XL Moving and Storage, an award-winning Allied Van Lines agent with offices in Greensboro and Raleigh. Thanks to their 25 years of experience helping North Carolinians all across the state with their moving and storage needs, XL has become the trusted hometown North Carolina moving services company. Our good friends Jim Dorsett and Jody Hatley, along with their hardworking staff, offer customized, tailored relocation and storage solutions to the people of North Carolina and beyond. Visit them online today at xlms.com. That's E-X-C-E-L-M-S dot com. Welcome back to This Week in College Football with David Glenn, presented by our friends at the North Carolina Port Council. Now, as you know, if you've been a longtime watcher of our show this year, our focus on This Week in College Football is going to be forward-looking as often as possible. We are going to take a glance back at the previous week in college football, too. So with that thought in mind, we bring you our quick glance back to Week 10, brought to you by our good friends at Jimmy's Bar and King Neptune Restaurant in Wrightsville Beach. Jimmy's has a full bar nightly drink specials, and live music 365 days a year. And right next door, King Neptune has become one of the best restaurants in the entire greater Wilmington area. You can keep up with Jimmy's on Facebook and learn more about King Neptune Restaurant at neptuneswb.com. Week 10 DG offered some intriguing developments beyond those we've already talked about, including a few games we previewed on our show last week, like UNC's win at Florida State. Duke's loss at Miami. North Carolina Central's loss at South Carolina State, Wingate's huge win at number 12, Lenore Ryan, and Fable State's upset of previously undefeated and number 16th ranked Johnson C. Smith in Charlotte. So given that all four of the teams you listed last week as our best candidates for the annual <laughs> best college football season in North Carolina honor, Johnson C. Smith, Duke, NC Central, Lenore Ryan, well, you know what they did? They all lost, D.G., where do we go from here? You can't cancel the award, can you? <laughs> no, we cannot. And and I actually am not feeling healthy enough, Chris, if anybody suggests that we jinxed the entire state with our best season rankings a week ago. It did freak me out on my son's wedding weekend when I noticed looking at the scores that all four of our top teams lost on Saturday, or, or in one case, I guess it was Thursday night. We do not cancel the award under any circumstances. <laughs> As I said earlier, Johnson C. Smith still has a shot at one of the best seasons in the history of that program. So the Golden Bulls, despite that surprising home loss last week to Fayetteville State, they do remain a legitimate candidate for this honor, at least for now. Similarly, if and probably only if Duke can win out and get to that extremely rare 10-win mark, well then with no apologies, of course, the Blue Devils could still claim that best season in North Carolina title. But we definitely, my final thought of this show, we definitely have a new contender in these rankings. Among those 33 NCAA football programs here in North Carolina that you mentioned, a lot of people are surprised to learn that we have that many. Only one out of 33, at least as we speak, things can change. Some other teams need help to become contenders for their conference title. But as we speak, only one of 33 is guaranteed, as we speak, to play for its conference championship. And in this particular case, we already know that they get to do it on their home field. <laughs> I heard you say Wingate, so I'm going to say the Wingate Bulldogs. <laughs> Balance. Who went, <laughs> who went to arch rival Lenore Rhine and beat 
the number 12 team in the Division II rankings, the Bears. That was 14 to 10 when get over Lenore Ryan last Saturday. The Bulldogs already have clinched the Piedmont Division of the South Atlantic Conference at the D2 level. In that particular league, the championship game host happens to rotate from year to year between the two divisions. And this year, it just happens to be that the Piedmont division gets its turn again to host the championship game. So Wingit, now ranked 24th in the Division II poll, it Wingit does actually play Newberry this Saturday. But regardless of that outcome, the Bulldogs, we already know, will get to host the league's Mountain Division champion next Saturday, meaning November 16th. The likely opponent in that South Atlantic Conference Championship game will be nationally ranked Carson Newman. It's not clinched yet, but 8-1 and one Carson Newman must only beat 1-7 and seven Tusculum this Saturday to reach the title game and face the Wingate Bulldogs on their home field. All time, and this stuff matters for best season in North Carolina purposes, all time, Wingate has won only two South Atlantic Conference Championships in the sport of football. They weren't too, too long ago. One was 2010. The other was 2017. They both came under Joe Reich, who is now the university's athletic director. But this is the program's first year under the guy I mentioned, longtime defensive coordinator, recently promoted to head coach, Rashawn Jordan. If somehow Wingate pulls this off, the Bulldogs would be tough to beat for the season of the year honors. And let's face it, Coach Rashawn Jordan, as a first-year coach, might be tough to beat for our Coach of the Year award as well. We're going to hope to have better luck with our picks this week <laughs> in college football, presented by the North Carolina Port Council. Huge thanks to the North Carolina Port Council for being the founding partner of the North Carolina Sports Network. And we also welcome our friends at Atlantic Tire and Service, now with six locations in the Triangle as our newest sponsor. A quick reminder, DG and his staff posting daily articles at our fast-growing website, ncsportsnetwork.com, which has direct links on the homepage to this YouTube channel, the wide variety of places you can find on-demand audio and podcast of our show, The David Glenn Show, and all of our other offerings, and updates on year two of our old North State tailgate and traveling sports circus, which has two stops this week. On Thursday, our crew will be hanging out with our friends from Pirate Radio from 5.30 to 7.30 at their setup near Dowdy Thickland Stadium, leading up to ECU's 8 o'clock kickoff against Florida Atlantic. Then on Saturday, back to the capital city, where we'll be outside Carter Finley Stadium from noon until 3, leading up to that 3.30 kickoff between Duke and NC State. So for David Glenn, I'm Chris Edwards. Thanks for joining us on This Week in College Football with David Glenn right here on the North Carolina Sports Network.